My name is Louise Boothby. I'm an investment partner at Collar Capital, which is a global secondaries fund. I have the pleasure this morning of moderating the esteemed panel, Giovanni, Dana, and Daniel. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about how LPs are currently allocating capital um, and their views on the market and into 2020. So I will let you introduce yourselves before we kick off with the content, Giovanni. Sure. Um, Giovanni Orsi. I um, run the private equity funds and syndicate investment team at uh, PSP Investment. PSP is uh, one of the um, Canadian uh, uh, pension fund with over $175 billion uh, AUM. Private equity is about 14% of that, uh, of that uh, allocation. And we invest the capital of the uh, you know, public sector pensioners and the uh, Canadian Armed Forces. Great. Good morning. My name is Dana Hamoff. I am a senior portfolio manager with J.P. Morgan's private equity group. Um, we have been with J.P. Morgan for over 22 years. The genesis of our group um, spun, spun out of AT&T's pension plan, and we continue to invest in global basis in early stage venture capital growth and mid-market buyout funds, as well as co-investing and secondary opportunities. Good morning, I'm Daniel Winter. I'm uh, heading up the Scandia team. Uh, Scandia, as you might know, is a Swedish life insurance company, 50 billion uh, on the balance sheet, um, investing in private equity and infrastructure uh, and uh, a bunch of all the other alternative stuff. But private equity and infrastructure is around 14% in total. Um, so that's, yeah, briefly. Great. So let's start at the top, or rather, are we at the top? So Prequin's latest investor survey overwhelmingly says 74% of investors think they're at the peak of the cycle. But the numbers were kind of similar the six months prior and the six months prior to that. So are we really at the peak of the peak? Dana, what do you think? You know, um, we're obviously up there. Um, all the data would support that. Um, I think from our perspective, we don't you know, time these markets. We don't accurately predict. I don't think anyone can accurately predict these markets, obviously. But we're certainly um, mindful. And how that resonates in kind of our investment um, commitments and judgment is, is really kind of vetting um, you know, how, you know, on the fund side, how these managers perform during downturns, what their portfolio looks like, um, sensitivities around you know, how they're entering, you know, multiples being paid, use of leverage, all the things I actually <laughs> heard the last panel speak about. Um, so I think it is a, a very much a, a consistent mindfulness um, and, and stress testing, particularly at this point in the cycle. Daniel, what do you think? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, um, I'm just thinking going back to, Four or five years, everyone th thought the market was on, you know, peaking at back then. So it's, I mean, it goes back to it's really, really hard to, to, um, to time the markets. And you know, so, some research would suggest that, um, well, I think most research would suggest that the alpha, the outperformance versus the, the, the public market is higher during a downturn. Um, so given that, I mean. Uh, you could almost end up in a conclusion that you should increase your investments at, in, in, in the peak scenario if you're, if you're at the peak, just given that outperformance. Now, if you have a hurdle rate to beat, that's not a good strategy. But for us, as a life insurance company, the reasons for, for my private equity portfolio to, to exist is to beat the stock market. And if we can do that in a better way, in a down scenario, I, I don't see any reason to stop investing, reduce my investments. So. Um, the alpha point is an interesting one, but do you think that there's a bifurcation between managers? So the median has increased, but perhaps the lower performing managers are even worse? Yeah, I, I think there's a spectrum of risk to be considered. And, and you know, some types of risk we don't you know, uh, like in this uh, situation. I would say sort of aggressive managers, you know, young teams who haven't been around for, for 20 years, uh, a lot of leverage strategies, those kind of things we tend to weight down. Um, so definitely in the, in, the, in the choice of where to allocate the, the capital and also looking at the segments of the market where the capital has gone in, 
you know, it's, it's, it's in the biggest class, the, the large caps, uh, mid, mid caps and low caps have been relatively flat. Um, so those kind of things will alter our decision on where to invest, um, but we're, we're keeping the foot on the paddle. Giovanni, what's your view on where we are in the cycle and how is that impacting your investment? Yeah, I mean, look, regardless of where we are, in, uh, you know, regardless of where we are in the cycle, I just repeat, you know, um, I agree with the other two, um, two panelists. I think for us is, given the nature of our, um, of our program, you know, what is it that we're going to be doing? What is it that we, that we do now? And, and first thing is we're not going to stop investing. If anything, we need to keep investing, right? So, that, so that's, you know, we're not withholding capital to the asset class where, you know, for some of the reason that Daniel said, but also for some of the, uh, just like the nature of our program. So, you know, when you look at it, how do we do it? Um, we keep, uh, you know, we keep investing with a um, hybrid uh, business model of funds and, and co-investments. Um, you know, we are really, uh, you know, really investing with, uh, you know, partners who are obsessed with the downturn and, and thinking about the downturn. So people who are looking at real cash flows, people who are really, uh, you know, scrutinizing those uh, EBDA adjustments, uh, you know, that we see in the market that are, you know, outrageous. <laughs> so, uh, so we're really looking at that. Um, you know, then, then what we're thinking about, uh, um, you know, managers who are able to play across cap the capital structure. Uh, who have a more flexible, uh, you know, um, investment um, strategies. So that's something that we are consciously uh, thinking about. Then when you look at our co-investment program, it's really about the type of, uh, you know, subset of sectors that we're looking at, you know, whether it's uh, tech, healthcare, but really going into, into, into the subsectors there. So what specific assets, companies should we, should we back? Um, you know, and we are obviously doing a, a thorough exercise, you know, bottom up in trying to understand the impact of, uh, um, you know, the impact of a potential recession and what that would look like on our portfolio. Um, I think it's also very, uh, very key to, to look at it, not just from a private asset class point, of, uh, sorry, from a um, private equity asset class point of view, but when you look at it, uh, you know, <clears throat> on the overall at the overall funds level like we do, then it's really, we have a continuous dialogue with our you know, CIO to, to think about a buffer, right? So it's not the asset class withholding or thinking about how to, uh, necessarily thinking about how to, um, again, have some extra capital to invest in the long term, but it's really a continuous dialogue and make sure that we have that buffer in case uh, valuation are, are, are hit on a, on a downturn. Um, so that's, that's, how, that's how we are, I think that's how we're thinking about it. That's how we're gonna, that's how we're gonna um, keep investing, really. I would just add um, everything you said. We're very much a bottoms-up investor, but one of the things we are looking at, particularly as many of our core relationships have come back on the, on the fund side this year, so we've, we've put quite a bit over our 10-year average um, capital to work this year. Um, but one of the things we are looking at is fund size. And as we all know, fund size have definitely creeped and more than creeped up. And everybody says, well, we'll have lots of dry powder to invest when the downturn comes, right? Mm. And take advantage of what you were talking about. But the, the backside of that is, you know, this is a mature industry, mm. as Kurt said. And, you know, sellers are astute and they're more knowledgeable and they're not gonna sell. So we really wanna come back to the stress testing what do you do when there's not high quality assets to buy? You know, you're gonna have to sit there maybe for six months or a year, as we saw in the great financial crisis, of, of sitting on all this capital. And what does that do to the culture? What does that do to underwriting judgment? And so those are also more of the, I guess, softer things that we're also vetting um, when we look at funds and re-upping, particularly in light of this huge step up in, mm. in capital mm. that we're seeing each firm raise. Yeah, and interesting to that as well is, uh, when you when you're looking at funds and doing due diligence and their ability to invest, sometimes it like take a bit of a leap of faith, right? Because a lot Absolutely. of the investment teams um, haven't invested through a crisis. That's right, and they right? have to grow into those funds right? with so, new resources. Correct. So is how if people, you know, you start looking also at how people are have learned those skills. Where have they learned them from? How, you know, is there any example of success in the pri in the in the previous um, uh, you know uh, down cycle? So that's a bit, a bit trickier, I guess, because 
you know, everybody has been uh, enjoying this, uh, <laughs> this ride. I think the operational skills within that menu will become even more important o o under recession, given that you know, the inv investment activity will be reduced. Uh, yeah, so that we are biased to sort of managers with more oper operational capabilities, uh, preferably in house. Uh. So the idea that you will continue to invest through a cycle, you you think a downturn may be coming, but actually you will keep investing now. Does that become harder if there is a crisis? I.e., managers are out right now in anticipation of. <laughs> it may be trickier to fundraise in the midst of a recession. What happens to deployment then? Have you got any experience of actually being able to write new commitments to funds that are trying to raise in the middle of a recession? Or even co-investment flow, I guess. You know, I would have thought that volume would reduce in a downturn. Actually, how do you continue to put money out as an, an LP in that period? Sometimes that works to our advantage because a longer, you know, <coughs> fundraise cycle allows us to, I, you know, we have this common of hanging out by the hoop where they have a first close, they make some investments. It's not complete blind pool. You get to know them over a longer period of time. Your due diligence can be more bespoke to your liking versus just, a, you know, a very organized quick process. So sometimes we use that to, to our advantage and our investors' advantage. Yeah, and this is where some of those more opportunistic investments might, might come in as well, right? So to have some, well, when we, again, while, while um, I said our, our investment paces will continue, are we thinking about is there some part of that capital that will utilize a bit more opportunistically when, um, you know, certain managers might come to the market during the crisis or they might have some, you know, uh, side pockets to invest in specific, um, in specific investment opportunities during the crisis. So, that, so that's, how, that's how we're thinking about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't see the negative aspects of, of you know, sort of a reduced activity generally. Yeah. I mean, I think it's time for, for a period where, where the pace slows down and, um, you know, if, if the downturn is really severe, I think there will be a reset of some of the fees and then the, sort of the, 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 uh, the carry schemes in, in the industry, which um, in some as aspects would be healthy. Can I, can I challenge you on that? Did you, <laughs> did you see much of that last time? Some, I think, and not perhaps on, on the headline management fee and, and the headline carry, but looking, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of other stuff that goes into the whole package of what you pay and, and sort of where, where the, the, the power relies between the GP and the LP. And I think, um, I think uh, you know, management fees tend to stay at the same level or, or, or sort of slightly reduced, but uh, carry certainly stays at the same, same level. <laughs> Um, but I think uh, on, on a bunch of other stuff, we, we saw that they came down and now they're back. Uh, so um, I think where you'll see some of those opportunities perhaps um, is on the secondary side and being more creative around, um, you know, whether it's staples or what we have GP solutions, obviously. We talk about some of the GP solutions putting their best assets in special purpose vehicles maybe you start to see more creative ways around that, it's just an extension of what we're already seeing in today's market, but more on maybe a discount to NAV as opposed to par or premium that we're seeing today. So we've talked a lot about macro. What other themes are you currently seeing? I know we discussed a little bit around tech. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, two themes that are, that are um, on, you know, Again, they're very broad team, themes, but that are um, on our minds at the moment are definitely, you know, uh, disruption, so tech disruption, and, uh, um, and impact uh, to a certain, you know, investment with purpose, investing with impact. Those are definitely two things that we're, that we're thinking about. On disruption, um, it's, really, it's really about getting um, just better informed and, and gaining knowledge both for our existing portfolio but also for uh, you know, uh, future investments. So, so we have done it by, the way we do it is, uh, the moment we have started a small, like early, um, early growth investment program, both on the fund side and the, as a, as a co-investor, you know, we, uh, 
we have invested in some of the um, AI ecosystem that is developing in Canada around Montreal and, and, and Toronto. And those have really been, you know, smaller investment, but really driven on knowledge sharing. Right? So, so that we have a chance to go through our portfolio with some of these um, uh, specialists and really look at where, where you know, um, on the defensive end, where, where could we be challenged? And on the offensive end, where should we invest? What, what should we do? And so that has been, um, you know, that has been a, a theme that we're following, you know, in a very practical matter. Now uh, all of our, you know, most of our memos now have a disruption section, and we talk about it. Uh, and and it's a question that we obviously ask our uh, partners and fund managers as well when we do due diligence, both on uh, on um, co-investment and, and funds. Um, so that's one. Um, impact and investment purpose is another, uh, you know, I smile a bit, but it's actually, uh, it's something that we, um, that we are uh, keen on and, 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 and focus on because we think that that is actually, uh, well, personally, I think it's going to be a long-term trend that is, that is going to stick to the industry. And so, again, we're thinking about, you know, how to, how to, um, how to measure it you know, how to measure, like, and, I'm, and I'm thinking about, you know, social impact here, right? So how to measure it, how to uh, manage it, you know, by, in the existing investments that we have across asset classes, and then how to actively invest on it. So where to put uh, money around which, which themes uh, on impact. So that, those, I think, are two macro areas that, we, that, are, that, are, that are good, interesting challenges for us. The, the impact is... Is super interesting. Do you think, as an institution, you've made a mental leap to be willing to sacrifice financial returns or no. divert financial return to So absolutely return? not. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's be let's be clear. Absolutely not. Uh, we're talking about uh, which is why the measure, which is why we're really thinking about the measurement. So it needs to be uh, you know private equity like returns. They need. Uh, you know, productivity-like returns with then a, an extra component which need to be measured uh, appropriately. And if anything, um, if anything, I think if if done well, there is a chance that some of those um, some of those early um, some of those early impact investments are out there could actually be accretive to our portfolio returns. That, that's that's what I'm hoping for, and that's what I'm betting. Right? And yeah. we'll be monitoring that very closely. Yeah, our, our hope um, and a big part of our due diligence and when we're underwriting is to make sure that impact is, is not only just, you know, a side or a nice to have or check the box, it's actually fully integrated in the overall underwriting and sourcing and how they're thinking about investing on the fund side and on the co-investment side. And I hope in a short amount of time that will just be completely integrated regardless of the investment strategy. Mm. You know, we should know and one of the questions we ask um, our, our fund managers is, you know, what is the carbon footprint of company A, company B? You know, what's the diversity? What's the, you know, social impact? What's the environmental impact? And just getting accustomed to asking these questions straight on without separating them to, okay, now we're going to talk about ESG in your portfolio. I think that is really important. And while it's probably more dominant over here in Europe, um, the hope, and we see it because a large part of our portfolio is in the U.S., it, it's slowly trickling and, and being more institutionalized across those. So definitely a theme we're seeing. So <clears throat> for me, I, 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 I was still to sort of land on, on my conclusion on impact funds, you know, because for me, it's, it's a strategy to, to look for certain companies with certain characteristics. So, so if you have this as a strategy, you will, you know, you set up your processes so you source those type of opportunities and when you, when you actually own them, you add value in a certain way. But, but that's a strategy as any other strategy. You can be consumer focused, you can be turnaround focused. Um, so for me, that's a strategy. And if that strategy will work out, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's, uh, for me, it's too early to say. Um, but, um, and I, I mean, I'm based in Scandinavia, I'm based in Sweden, and, and, and you know, there's a lot of things going on with ESG there, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's just this massive momentum and this massive wave to do more. And, um, you know, I, I want to raise some, a finger of caution as that, you know, there is so much willingness to do more that sort of sometimes you lose the perspective of what is important. Uh, I see it daily in Sweden that 
small stuff get blown up to be a big matters for, for, for the environment, you know, but um, I think um, you need, really need to focus on what is important and what will actually have a, a big impact. Um, and there's, there's, today is more like you should do everything. You should measure everything, and you should uh, report everything, and um, you should push for everything. Um, and I don't think that's the best strategy to, to really have an impact. I think you should be more, more focused. Um, um. Okay, so we've talked a bit about disruption. We've, we've talked about impact. Any other themes that are making you nervous right now? Or excited? Uh, maybe I can just yeah, throw one on. out there. Because I was here yesterday listening to the, to the secondaries uh, sessions. And I think it's just remarkable the way the secondaries market have grown. And I asked you some questions about it before here. Uh, and for me, um, so, so what I was thinking about yesterday is the, you know, the notion of liquidity premium in the asset class of private equity. It's illiquid, so you need to get the, liquid, the liquidity premium. And uh, you know, the second mar secondary markets has been great in providing liquidity, but it's actually reducing the liquidity premium, right? Because mm. that's, that's the... That's the that's the way it will work. I mean, if, you, if it gets easier to sell the things and the trading cost is reduced, that liquidity premium is actually being compressed by the efficiency of the secondary market. I don't know. But still in excess of a public market return. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you can argue whether there is a liquidity premium in some parts of the market today. Uh, with, with, I mean, because there's so much capital flowing into parts of the private equity market. So it, are, are investors really thinking about that and the supply and demand imbalance? Um, and is there actually a liquidity premium still in the market? I, I, I mean, for me, it's, it's a matter of equilibrium. I mean, if there is an equilibrium, the, there should be a liquidity premium. Um, but, you know, looking just at over the past five years, there's been so much capital flowing in. So I don't know if it's still there. So what's left? I mean, the governance model is still superior to, to, the, to the public market. So that, that's still left. And I th I'm a big believer of the governance model. But uh, you know, the session yesterday got me thinking about these kind of things. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's. Louise, uh, your best answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, well, maybe you should jump in. I think it still exists, right? I think the reality is, whilst the secondary market is growing very aggressively and we would expect will continue to grow, it's still such a small proportion of the primary market, you know, very low single digits in terms of percentages, mm. that actually I think we're, we're some way off actually not needing any kind of liquidity premium. But maybe in. 15 years or 20 years? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's great. I mean, we, we use the secondary markets every now and then to, to, for portfolio management reasons, of course, and it's great. Correct. Uh, yeah, it's very tough for us. It's very topical as we think about portfolio management, as we think about benchmarking of the asset class. That's exactly the question that we're asking ourselves. Uh, is, this, does, is there still a liquidity premium for the PE market or should it be reduced? Mm. Yeah. That's exactly the question I'm trying to answer. But to what Louise said, I mean, yesterday, you know, yesterday there was a, you know, I think it was mentioned that uh, the, the secondary market is going to be, what, 250 billion? But it's still, what, 7 billion of, uh, 7 trillion of yep. PE money, right? So it's still less than 5% of the market. So we've got five minutes left, so I'm going to check whether there's any questions uh, from the audience that people would like to ask. If not, I will keep going. Anyone? No? Nope. Okay, so let's turn our attention to 2020 predictions, things we're definitely going to see. I'm going to take Brexit, but I'm not going to say which one, US whether election. I think it's going <laughs> to happen or not. Fair enough. Okay, and any <laughs> predictions? I yeah. mean, when I, we look at our forward calendar, it is still pretty robust in terms of core existing names, um, new opportunities. When we look at our clients' capital, 
um, that what they want us to to commit for them, it, it's still very strong. So I think even more importantly into this topic, um, being more rigorous on our due diligence and more rigorous on kind of underwriting these these managers. Yeah, 2020 actually. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I, I I don't disagree. It's probably uh, more. It's probably more of the same actually, apart from uh, you know the macro, you know, apart from Brexit and everything else that is going going on. I mean, we um, we opened um, we open a, we we just opened our Asian office. And uh, yeah, we're, we're actually monitoring obviously what's going on, in, and we opened in Hong Kong about six months ago, and we are obviously monitoring what's going on, what's going on, uh, what's going on there. It's really interesting, right? Because when you uh, when you um, when you speak to people who have uh, you know lived there for a long time and everything, they're all very very relaxed and pretty um, chilled, <laughs> I would say, about what's going on. When you talk to maybe. A more recent expats, it's, it's really there's there's a bit more unsettlement. So it would be interesting for me just uh, to see how that develops over the next uh, few months, actually. Yeah, I mean it's written in the stars, so, you know, God knows. Uh, but um, um, I think, I mean, ESG and impact will 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 definitely be a topic for for 2020. Um, um, yeah. All right. Well, with that, all that's left me to do is thank my esteemed panelists, Giovanni, Dana, Daniel. Thank you very much for your thank time you. this morning. Thanks.